The American electric grid has had quite a rocky history. From a complete lack of desire to adopt such a revolutionary technology, to political corruption, to many who denied even the possibility of a national grid of electricity where even those who weren't extravagantly wealthy or lived outside of cities could also use power. It was the work of brilliant engineers and a determined few that led them that would ultimately lead to the electric grids allowing you to watch this very video. Today, we're picking up where we left off on our our last video about Samuel Insull and the extraordinary impact he had on the United States' power grid. If you want to watch that first video, you can click on the link in the top corner of this video. Otherwise, let's learn something new. Let's start by going back to the late 1800s. It was a time when big stores and offices were looking to adopt electricity, but instead of connecting to a grid like they would today, each individual business had its own small power plant generating the electricity it needed. When cities wanted lights anywhere from the streets to their homes, they tended up going with gaslit lamps instead, something the gas companies were very intent on keeping politicians in favor of, especially as political corruption on the city level was still a major problem across America. This was the state of the country as Samuel Insull worked to help Thomas Edison get an electric grid set up throughout the country. It was thought to be a near impossible task to even get the rights to set it up, much less convince the local populations to invest money in the central stations. Samuel Insull had spent his entire youth preparing for this though, meeting with marketing geniuses such as P.T. Barnum as discussed in our previous video. As Thomas Edison's right-hand man, Sam worked to get cities on board. Edison's company often took stock in the new electric company companies as partial payment for the equipment they bought from Edison's factories. And this experience broadened Sam's education even further. By the age of 25, he knew some of the most important investors and politicians on both sides of the Atlantic. He understood every nook and cranny of America, and he especially understood local politics, competition, financing, marketing, and technology. But it was in the years 1885 and 1886 that two developments dramatically increased the demand for these centralized stations. First, the trolley was perfected. By 1889, 154 of these trolley systems were in operation around the United States. These trolleys required massive amounts of power, which for many years exceeded the demand for business and residential power. Since electricity cannot be easily stored, especially at that time, it had to be produced at the same instant it was used. Trolleys used the most power during rush hour, when the demand for homes and offices was lower, helping out the new industry greatly. The second crucial development was the perfection of AC electricity, also known as alternating current, by George Westinghouse, Nikola Tesla, and several others, all of whom Sam was in close contact with. DC, or direct current electricity like Edison was a huge proponent of, could only be economically transmitted about a mile from the central station, whereas AC could be transmitted hundreds of miles. Trolleys and AC electricity led to a boom in central stations, though isolated plants and gas continued to be competitive. Insull would eventually come to believe in AC, but Edison's ego would not allow him to approve of it. Though despite this, using DC power just wasn't economically viable, and eventually everyone would convert to AC. As sales of central stations and equipment began to boom, Edison needed to expand his manufacturing companies, setting up all of Edison's electrical equipment factories in upstate New York. Edison put Insull in charge, telling him to do it big Sammy, big success or big failure. Upstate New York City would become the hub of innovation and production in the electricity industry under Sam's organized leadership. In the first two years, Sam set up one of the earliest national sales organizations and quadrupled the company's sales. And over the six years that Insull ran manufacturing and selling for Edison, the number of workers in their New York facility grew from 200 to 6,000. Profits boomed, and the value of the company grew sixfold. Despite this growth, the company was always short on cash. Every penny of profit was going back into the expansion of the company and research of new technologies. And this was a policy that Insull would keep with him for the rest of his life. As Edison's finance man, Samuel Insull spent enormous amount of times raising money and dealing with bankers, including J.P. Morgan, whom neither he nor Edison were very fond of. It was these financial dealings that led to the creation of the Edison General Electric Company in 1889. This restructuring resulted in the merger of several of Edison's companies. New cash was invested in the company, which also meant new cash in Edison's pocket. And while learning to manage such a large operation, Sam soon discovered the importance of treating workers with respect 
respect and paying them more than the competitors would for their talents. He did this not necessarily out of generosity, but because it made the factory run smoother and with fewer labor problems. Though one of the most important practices that Insul would develop here was the lowering of prices in order to increase production and lower costs. While most thought that electric lights would only become a luxury for the rich, he and Edison proclaimed that they were going to make it so cheap that only the rich would be able to afford to burn candles. Under Insul, the price of lamps, though today we call them light bulbs, dropped from $1 in 1886 to 50 cents in 1890. As Edison General Electric grew, it had plenty of competitors though, notably George Westinghouse with the Westinghouse Electric Corporation. But that would hardly slow them down, as under Insul's management, the Edison General Electric Company went from making a profit of $700,000 to $2 million in just two years, with $11 million in sales. But at that point, another electric company, Thomas Houston, was generating about $10 million in sales. And due to rapid growth and financing their customers by taking stock instead of cash, Edison General Electric had $3.5 million of debt. That's when J.P. Morgan stepped up, holding a large block of stock in Edison's companies, including many of Edison's patent rights. He decided that the electrical industry needed to be consolidated. Other major investors also worked toward a big merger of the industry, and when the dust settled in the spring of 1892, Edison General Electric merged with Thomas Houston, creating General Electric as we know of them today. While Edison did make money on the deal, he was no longer in control, and thus quickly lost interest. Sam, on the other hand, was offered a vice presidency at GE with a salary of $36,000 a year. He was the only Edison man offered an executive position with General Electric, but Sam thought he had earned more. He thought that he had earned the presidency of GE, and he had little respect for the new owners. So he helped in the transition of the new company, and then quit. So then 32-year-old Sam began to look around for the next opportunity, and he found a big one. After noticing how Chicago had grown from a population of 300,000 in 1870 to over 1 million in 1890, he took a job as the president of the Chicago Edison Company with two requirements. The first is that he would have complete control, and the second was that the board would handle all the funding of his ideas. And the biggest of those ideas was building the largest power station in the world. It wouldn't become fully operational until 1894, but once it did, it was indeed the largest in the world. But he pushed for even more capacity. Chicago Edison's power output would go on to dwarf the amount produced by the other electric companies in other big cities for the next 40 years. At that time, Chicago Edison served about 5,000 customers. Most people thought that someday they might have 25,000, but Samuel Insull wasn't satisfied with thousands. He wanted to serve millions. He began buying up other Chicago electric utilities, absorbing their customers. Insull's huge investment in his big power plant resulted in plenty of capacity beyond his current needs. By adding customers and service areas, he used more of the capacity of his plant, spreading the capital investment over more kilowatts produced, and thereby lowering the cost of producing each kilowatt hour. Sam also led the industry in innovation. He developed new types of financing and accounting for utilities. He introduced statistical studies to the industry so that he knew exactly when and where electricity was needed. And almost every insole and innovation gradually became common practice throughout the utility industry, as Sam shared everything he knew, founding and chairing the key national electric associations. After six years of Sam's leadership and 16-hour workdays, the company was 10 times as big as when he took over. Every time he asked for steam engines that could produce more electricity, he was told it couldn't be done. Then he would proceed to find someone who could do it. In 1903, he was testing a 3,000 kilowatt hour engine. Within a decade, it was 35,000 kilowatt hours. In a decade after that, it was over 175,000. By 1911, he had expanded to over 100 suburban communities around Chicago, most of which had no electricity before Insul's company served them. He was one of the earliest people to understand the economies of scale involved in mass production. He told his salespeople, sell it so low that no one can afford not to have the electrical services. When he began in 1892, the price of electricity in Chicago was 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Five years later, it cost a dime, and by 1909, two and a half since. Between 1898 and 1913, Sam's customer list grew from 10,000 
to 200,000. And because of his commitment to building a strong national electrical system, Samuel Insull often helped utility companies all over the United States, serving on their boards or doing consulting for them. Sometimes he would take stock in the company as payment, resulting in small ownership positions from Pennsylvania to Louisiana to California and that allowed his reach to become enormous. He knew every American president from McKinley to Hoover. By the time he was 50, Samuel Insull was the undisputed leader of the American electric utility industry, and he even helped design a national government-owned system for the United Kingdom. With this great reach and network came a lot of money. He ended up buying a yacht in a country estate near Libertyville, Illinois, where he built a mansion. But it was this rural venture of his that led to him expanding his utility interests to the rural side of Illinois. Experts of the time believed the idea of serving small, widely separated towns was foolish and could never prove to be profitable. Even the Secretary of Agriculture in Washington dismissed his ideas. But in 1911, he started the Public Service Company of Northern Illinois. Since none of the financiers he talked to believed in him, he had to finance this company with his own personal borrowing capacity, but it would go on to be profitable from the very beginning. In its first four years, the company grew from 6,700 customers to over 65,000 customers in 150 communities, and the rates dropped almost in half during that time. Then he expanded into central Illinois, where he grew a company from 15,000 customers to 150,000 customers. Soon, he was buying up firms all across the Midwest, not just electric companies, but gas, water, ice, and trolley companies as well. One Texas-based company called Southland Ice was later renamed to 7-Eleven. It seemed as though Samuel Insull could do no wrong. He was experiencing a meteoric rise that was seemingly endless, but ultimately, it would all come crashing down. In our next video, we're going to dive into how he went from a billionaire to a criminal who died with millions of dollars in debt. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, do me a favor and hit the like button. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on the grand finale to this short series on Samuel Insull. Thanks again, and I will see you next time.